So as you know, I've, I've spent a good amount of time examining the Hebrew Roots movement. I, I've written a couple books, I've written a lot of blog articles, and there's a podcast and, and uh, videos. And I've talked about how it falls short theologically, but recently it occurred to me that the Hebrew Roots movement also falls short philosophically. And that's what we're going to look at today. <laughs> So the Hebrew Roots Movement you may have heard of, it's probably the most popular flavor of what's called Torahism, which is this general belief that followers of Jesus, that Christians, are supposed to also be keeping the Torah of Moses. And look, I get the appeal. It's really heady and exciting to dive in and try to understand the cultural, the historic, the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith and understand Jesus in his cultural context. I get that. I'm excited by that same thing. I'm, I'm learning biblical Hebrew. I've got tons of books that talk about, matter of fact, Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes. It's a fabulous book and it helps us to understand, to better understand the teachings of Jesus and the verses that we find in the Bible as we dig in and learn about the culture in which that Bible was created. So I get it that in the Hebrew Roots movement, the thing that's appealing is being able to dive in and reread scripture from this new perspective to kind of mine those tiny details and to unlock what the text is really saying. But somewhere along the lines, this desire to better understand the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, which is a beautiful thing to do, at some point it crosses the line and suddenly we've got Gentile Christians desiring to take on a Jewish mantle of obligation that was the, never theirs to take on. And this desire becomes so strong that in the Hebrew Roots movement, we see certain passages now being reinterpreted and distorted to fit that desire. And one thing I've noticed among my Hebrew Roots friends is they don't often stop to think about what would it mean if the Hebrew Roots theology was true? There's a, there's a whole set of logical entailments that come with accepting Hebrew roots as a true teaching. And that's what we're going to look at today. In fact, we're going to examine the logic of the Hebrew roots movement by looking at three theories on why it actually might be true. So today we're going to do a bit of a, a philosophical thought experiment. We're going to assume that Hebrew Roots Movement teaches a true theology. And then we're gonna take a look at three possible theories as to how mainstream Christianity, as I refer to it, got it wrong on the issue of the law and how Hebrew Roots Movement got it right. And by the way, if you are a member of the Hebrew Roots Movement or if you're just sympathetic to that perspective, I wanna hear from you. Take a look at the three theories we're going to look at today. Let me know if I've missed something, or better yet, let me know if you've got another theory that's stronger than the ones we're going to be taking a look at. I want to actually represent the Hebrew Roots Movement honestly, so let me hear from you. Okay, so let's jump in and take a look, and I'm going to work through this visually because I think that'll help keep us on track. So let's set the table here. We've got Jesus and the Apostles in the first century, right? And then 2,000 years passes. And then today we have the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now, on the one side of this debate, we've got Orthodox with a lowercase o, or what we might call mainstream Christianity, right? And they teach that the law of Moses is not required. And this refers to the Sabbath and the dietary restrictions and the feasts and so on. Um, now, opposed to that, on the other side, we've got the Hebrew Roots Movement, HRM. They say we do have to keep the law. Now, within Hebrew roots, some say it's a matter of salvation. Some say it's a matter of obedience. That, that distinction isn't really important for our purposes today. So, mainstream Christianity and Hebrew roots movement are opposed on this issue of the law. And for the sake of argument, we're assuming that Hebrew roots got it right and mainstream Christianity got it wrong. So, as I mentioned, this brings up a bunch of interesting questions. Things like, well, why is there such a big difference on this issue of the law? And what happened with, with mainstream Christianity? How did it veer off course so badly uh, on this issue? And, and how did Hebrew Roots Movement then figure out the truth that mainstream Christianity missed? So let's dig in and look at what might have happened. So the work and theology of Jesus and the apostles are recorded in a body of early writings that today we collectively refer to as the New Testament. And of course, this theology is entirely based on a collection of earlier writings that we would collectively refer to as the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, or the Jewish Bible, or in, in Judaism, they call it the Tanakh. It's all the same body of work, right? So 
the Hebrew Roots Movement has studied this entire body of work, right? That's the entire Christian Bible. And they've come to the conclusion that followers of Jesus are required to keep the Law of Moses. They believe that the scriptures teach that the Sabbath and the kosher food laws and the feasts and all that stuff are still required today of Christ followers. So, if Hebrew Roots is true, as we're assuming for our thought experiment today, where did mainstream Christianity go wrong? So, if Jesus and the apostles in the beginning taught that the law was required, right, as Hebrew Roots says, and then mainstream Christianity teaches that it's not, somewhere along the way, mainstream Christianity must have veered off the path. They must have lost their way, right? Now, when and how did that happen? And that's the question that I ask my Hebrew Roots friends. And I've heard a couple of theories on that, and that's what we're going to take a look at today, as well as I'm going to try to put on my thinking hat and play devil's advocate, so to speak, and present some other ideas about, you know, testing these theories, if, they, if it could possibly be true. <laughs> Now, the most common reason that I hear from my Hebrew Roots friends is that in the very early years or centuries of Christianity, there was this rampant anti-Semitism. And the early church fathers hated the Jewish people so much that they wanted to distance themselves from the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. So they began interpreting scripture with that sort of a bias, right? And this anti-Jewish bias led them to, to downplay or minimize um, the passages in scripture that seem to imply that the law was not required anymore. And this led to a corruption in mainstream Christian theology. That's our first theory. And as the theory goes, this corruption was then passed down from generation to generation until it became really normative for Christian theology. So could there be something to this theory? I mean, do we have evidence of early writings where we see this anti-Jewish sentiment playing out and maybe even we see Christian theology veering off course? We do have a lot of early writings that we have access to. Well, it just so happens that my capstone project for my master's degree was on this very subject. I actually looked into Jewish-Christian relations in the first three centuries of the faith to try to figure out, did anti-Jewish sentiment negatively impact or damage Christian theology. And in that process, I looked through all kinds of early Christian writings, uh, reading the original source materials for the first three centuries of the faith, really, uh, examined Jewish writings from the time. I consulted both Christian and Jewish historians about the era. Matter of fact, my book, Divergence, is the popular version of that capstone project. All that research behind uh, my capstone went into this book. What I discovered is that while there was anti-Jewish sentiment among the early Christian fathers, it didn't negatively impact Christian theology at all. In fact, the early Christians expressed a desire for the salvation of the Jewish people, and they spent a good amount of time studying the Hebrew scriptures and trying to help convince their, their Jewish counterparts that Jesus really was their Messiah. He was Yeshua Hamashiach, that he was the Messiah promised in the Hebrew Scriptures. The early church fathers revered the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. They, they considered it sacred inspired scripture. They committed great swaths of it to memory, and that's exactly what they used to build their theological arguments when they were sharing the gospel with their Jewish counterparts. In fact, there was a teacher in the early, in the early second century, around the year 140 or so, Marcion, and what he taught was that the, the God of the Old Testament was this vindictive tribal God and that the Old Testament should then be rejected and the God of the New Testament was a, was a different God. And he not only wanted to reject all of the Hebrew Bible, he also wanted to edit the New Testament documents to remove any references to the Old Testament. And so this is exactly what the Hebrew Roots uh, theory would say is like, hey, there was this corruption. The church fathers wanted to separate themselves. This is exactly what Marcion was doing. And you know what the mainstream Christian church told him how they responded to this, they branded him a heretic and they kicked him out of the church. There was no tolerance among the early church fathers for any kind of rejection of the Hebrew scriptures or the Jewish portion of the Christian story. And in fact, we see from the very earliest years of Christianity, even while the apostles were still alive in our, in our early writings, we see that mainstream Christianity taught that 
the, the law of Moses wasn't binding. They didn't feel obligated to keep Sabbath or keep the feasts or keep the, the dietary restrictions. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were right, but it does mean that this theory that we're looking at of some sort of malicious or intentional corruption of Christian theology in the early years, it's not supported by any historical evidence. So we'll cross that one out. <laughs> Okay, so maybe, rather than an intentional corruption, we've got something like an undetected error. You know, maybe there was some innocent error in early Christian theology that was unknowingly passed down through the generations until it became, you know, accepted as part of Orthodox Christian theology. And now today, the average Christian preacher doesn't even realize that what they learned in seminary has a corruption in it, you know? So let's explore that theory. So over the 20 centuries, from the time of Jesus until today, there have been obviously a whole lot of theologians and thinkers who have shaped mainstream Christian theology. I mean, in the early centuries, there was Ignatius and Polycarp and Clement and Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and Tertullian, Origen, uh, Cyprian, Athanasius of Alexandria, right? And then we get into, we've got, uh, you know, in the 5th century, we've got Ambrose and Augustine. Um, Aquinas, Anselm. That's a lot of A's in a row. Um, then we're getting closer like to the, uh, to the Reformation. We've got Hus and Luther, Erasmus, um, Ignatius. Uh, that's Ignatius of Loyola. Then we've got Zwingli, of course, and John Calvin and John Knox, and then, of course, the Wesleys. And then, of course, Jonathan Edwards and Herman Bavinck and Spurgeon um, and A.W. Tozer and Karl Barth and Brueggemann. And of course, we're getting into the modern era now. So we've got C.S. Lewis, we've got John Stott, we've got R.C. Sproul, Billy Graham, Timothy Keller. Now this timeline isn't really scaled appropriately, but, but you get the idea. So, and I've obviously left out a ton of others, hundreds of others, but these are the thinkers and theologians that, that really shaped mainstream Christian theology over the centuries. Um, and they were among the most brilliant minds. These weren't just religious people. I mean, look at Augustine, right? He was not only a theologian, but he's, he's sometimes even referred to as the grandfather of psychology because of the work that he did. Um, and then, you know, fast forward here, Jonathan Edwards. He's consistently listed as one of the most brilliant minds that America's ever produced, religious or otherwise. Now, all these thinkers and theologians subscribe to the mainstream Christian interpretation of the New Testament that the law of Moses is not binding on Christians. And these are some of the giants of the Christian faith that the Hebrew Roots movement disagrees with and says are wrong. So modern Hebrew Roots teachers and organizations are essentially claiming that they know better or they know more than these men on this issue. And of course, we have to grant that these are just mere human beings, right? As brilliant as they were, it doesn't mean they were necessarily correct on this issue. Nothing that they wrote is on par with scripture in terms of authority uh, or inerrancy. Again, as brilliant as these guys were, these men were certainly fallible human beings, right? Capable of error, just like anybody else. And of course, that means that we have to note that as fallible as these mainstream Christian thinkers were, Hebrew Roots Movement teachers are just as fallible and capable of error as well. So there's that. But still, the Hebrew Roots Movement advocate could certainly argue, and I think it's a reasonable argument to say that just because the bulk of Christian theologians and thinking trended in one direction, it doesn't mean it was trending in the right direction. And they could further argue that, you know, if an error was undetected early on, maybe it was replicated unknowingly, right, by future generations. Maybe, you know, without realizing it, these theologians inherited some sort of erroneous theological position that contained an error from a previous thinker and they didn't even realize it. If that was the case, then we have to ask, how did the Hebrew Roots Movement teachers discover this error? And, and why was it only discovered relatively recently? I mean, if we look back at the modern Hebrew Roots Movement, it kind of can be dated back maybe a century, back to Herbert Armstrong in the early 20th century. So how is it that they suddenly discovered that after 19 centuries previously, where no one saw it? Well, I know at least one Hebrew Roots teacher, Zach Bauer, who suggests that the reason that we're discovering this now and, we, and it wasn't caught earlier, actually he gives two reasons. Number one is that the world now has greater access to the Bible when historically speaking, it was very difficult for people to have their own Bible. And then the other thing he suggests is that, and this is true, literacy rates globally have skyrocketed in recent 
history, right, in the last century or two. So he's suggesting that now that the bulk of humanity has access to the Bible and is able to read it, they've been able to uncover the, the true meaning contained in the New Testament. But does that really explain anything? I mean, if access to the Bible and literacy have gone up dramatically in recent history, how does that affect the thinkers on our timeline here, you know, or the hundreds of others that I didn't mention? I mean, these were all men of higher education, many of whom were not only literate, but they were literate in multiple languages. They also had ready access to the scriptures. I mean, that, that's all they wrote about was what they discovered in scriptures, right? And these are the same exact scriptures, the same Christian Bible that the Hebrew Roots Movement is consulting today to, to arrive at their conclusion, yet all these f folks arrived at a different conclusion, right? And in fact, if you look at Christian theology over the centuries, it's worked something like the peer review process that we see in modern science. So great thinkers offer their theories, and then they're reviewed and criti critiqued by their peers, not only peers of their generation, but the peers of subsequent generations. So in the case of theology, you've got these, these doctrines and these suggestions that, that come down and are compared to the original body of Scripture, because again, all these men had access to that same body of Scripture. So these are educated, highly intelligent theologians who are now comparing these new theories against the, the biblical data, and over time, a consensus becomes formed as to what theories best match that biblical data. You know, this is the same thing we see in the sciences, right? Theories are suggested, and then they're reviewed by peers over time, and then they amass consensus. And we see something similar happen in Christian theology too, right? So it's exactly what you're looking at right now. This is the, this is the process of a peer review. I'm a peer of the Hebrew Roots teachers, and I'm reviewing what they're teaching, comparing it against Scripture, and so far I'm finding that, it, that it's coming up short. Now, who knows, maybe a century or two from now, new information will arise, and then Hebrew Roots Movement teaching about the law maybe will seem more reasonable. But so far, this theory that there was some sort of error in early Christianity that wasn't caught, and it was somehow unwittingly transmitted or, or carried down through the generations, through the different eras and centuries, uh, past all of these highly educated, highly qualified theologians and thinkers, and then only now in recent times has Hebrew Roots now discovered that something that all these people missed for 2,000 years, I find that really hard to believe. Matter of fact, personally, I would, I would put the likelihood of that happening somewhere in the statistically impossible range. So there's another theory as to how the mainstream Christian teachers and the Hebrew Roots teachers could have looked at the same body of biblical text and come to completely different conclusions on the issue of the law. We have to consider the possibility that maybe there was some sort of historical conspiracy going on. Maybe all of the mainstream Christian teachers throughout history have been so opposed to the Jewish people that they knowingly taught an errant theology to the Christian masses, and maybe any kind of rogue theologians along the way who brought up this issue of the law and saw things the way that the Hebrew Roots Movement does, maybe they were quashed by the church and the, everything they've done was wiped out of the history books, which would explain why the history books don't mention any of these thinkers. So let's assume for a second that there was a conspiracy. So then we have to ask, well, what was the goal of the conspiracy? And, and who would benefit from an errant reading of scripture on this issue? Maybe it was some anti-Semitic Christian leaders, right? Maybe they created this conspiracy. Um, and then we have to ask, okay, let's say that's true. Then how did they benefit from it? Were they, were they after power? Or were they after money or fame? or maybe control of something. And if that's the case, it doesn't seem to have worked. Maybe I'm missing something, but they don't seem to have leveraged that position about the law into any of those benefits. And moreover, we would have to then explain how do all these Christian thinkers and theologians in mainstream Christianity down through the centuries, what motivated them to maintain and keep this conspiracy going forward? Now it's ugly and sad, but we have to admit that the church has at times uh, overreached and abused its power to try to control the masses. But that sort of abuse of power wasn't based on this idea of, hey, you don't need to celebrate Sabbath or, or eat kosher food or keep the feasts, right? It, it was based on things like indulgences and, and giving the church the power over someone's salvation. So the idea of a conspiracy as a, as a grab for control or power just doesn't make any sense. But maybe we've got something that's a little more low-key. Maybe it was a conspiracy among Christian teachers who just simply didn't want to keep the law. Maybe they, they, 
created this lie and, and knowingly taught an errant theology so that they wouldn't have to attend Saturday Sabbath or they wouldn't have to keep the kosher food laws or keep the feasts. But that certainly doesn't seem like something that would motivate generations of Christian teachers to keep a lie for thousands of years just because they didn't want to give up pork. So maybe there is something to the racism angle. Maybe this is a conspiracy driven by racism and the, and the Christians simply wanted nothing to do with the, the Jewish people. They didn't want to think about them or associate with them. So instead, they decided to reinterpret scripture in such a way to separate it from the law of Moses, from its Jewish roots. And they kept that lie going. They kept that, that conspiracy going for 20 centuries. Of course, there's a pretty obvious problem with that conspiracy theory, and that's the fact that all these theologians and thinkers deeply studied the Hebrew Scriptures. In fact, many of them learned Biblical Hebrew so they could read the Jewish Bible in its original language. And all of the Jewishness that was in the Bible when it was written is still there today. So I don't know about you, but this whole conspiracy angle feels really weak to me. I mean, for the life of me, I can't think of any plausible motivation or reason that someone would create a conspiracy like this and knowingly teach a lie throughout the centuries. I mean, no one seems to benefit from doing that. These three theories that we've looked at, they just don't hold up well to scrutiny. So if you've got a different theory or maybe a stronger version of one of these theories, let me know. I mean, if you've got some way to explain how or why the mainstream Christian church would have knowingly or unknowingly taught a wrong theology for 2,000 years, and then suddenly, in recent times, the Hebrew Roots Movement has discovered that era and just broke the story wide open. If you've got a theory that can explain that, let me know down in the comments. I'll definitely make a video about that if anyone offers any strong theories. But in my opinion, a much more plausible explanation of the facts that we see here would be that it's our friends in the Hebrew Roots Movement who are getting this issue wrong, and the mainstream Orthodox Christian teachings have it right. Thanks for watching. Shalom.